miles. I didn't know a thing about this because when I was in there, I remember Terry, right about here, my, ra my radar navigator, called this and he said, we got big as a four miles and closing fast. Now, how long does that take? A couple of seconds to say? Big as a four miles and closing fast. Well, I looked up and suddenly I saw one light, then three lights, one up here, one down here, and this one light it was a big, turned into two lights, the wingtip lights, and this big gray shape came at me at 1100, almost 1100 miles an hour. And I'm looking at this, and then what happens to the mind? And my mind has been screwed up ever since, just ask Bob. This was so stunning that instantly my mind started going at 10,000 miles an hour. Microseconds lasted minutes to me. I watched this thing in slow motion come right at me. The nicest thing about the whole thing was they saw us at 14 miles and they started to dive. We saw them at four miles and we rolled out and somehow just hit them. And I'm looking at this thing and a drop tank is coming in. This is 18,000 pounds of gas. It's going to hit me in the face. What happens between the ears when this sort of thing happens? You look out, time stands still, and you start to go through. If you got cancer and spent five years dying, you go through the same emotions I went through in about half a second. I denied it. I got angry. I said, this isn't, isn't happening. It's not going to happen to me. Oh, I was mad. I worked all the way through college. I worked my life. Oh, I'm going to die right here. And it's going to be instant, and there won't be any pain at all, and it's going to be over like that. So I sat, and I looked at that thing, and what could you do? You're, it's absolutely impossible to do anything. If you, you couldn't pull the plane, you couldn't turn it, you couldn't do anything. I wished I'd known any of this before it happened. I'd have pulled that plane up 100 feet, levels off, and let him have it. And he could have flown it, and we'd have been just fine. But there it was, and it came through, and that big drop tank just slid underneath. And I thought, whoo, this big tail went by very slowly. I couldn't believe how slowly. I can still see it. Tail went just slowly riding by. I thought, whoo, we missed. Then I calculated mathematically. If our, their drop tank was going to hit me in the face, our drop tank is going to hit them in the tail and just then it went boom, about like that. And then, microsecond or two later, the biggest explosion I've ever seen, because I was in it. They saw this explosion 200 miles away in a couple of different directions, and the explosion was huge. What had happened is our right wing hit their vertical stabilizer in our drop tank area, blew our right wing off. We went down like this, just rolled over and went straight down. They knocked their tail off. They went into a spin, and they couldn't get out of that, of course. And I am sitting there looking at stuff, thinking maybe we're straight and level. I was actually thinking. I couldn't see anything because the right wing alternators ran the electricity upstairs in the B-52. The left wing alternators ran the downstairs electricity. So the navigators were talking, and, and uh, Terry was looking at my navigator. And he said 29, 28, 27, 26. And instead of saying 25, he said, go and Jay call you're ejected. Well, I am sitting there about the same thing, and I'm trying to fly the plane, but I can't see even the, the yoke here. And I look at the attitude indicator, and I could barely see it, and I couldn't see which way it was up, down, or in. I couldn't really see the throttles. Everything is black. I was blinded by the explosion, and, so, and then finally, you know, a few things came back. I couldn't tell you what time, how long it took, or anything, because it was just time had turned into microseconds, as you know. And I didn't know what was going on. So suddenly somebody ejected and fogged up the cockpit. And I said, well, it's time to jettison this airplane. So I said, this is a once in a lifetime thing. I'm at least alive right now. I sat straight up, put my feet back against the footrest, grabbed the handles and pulled. Nothing happened, but I got the trigger. And so I'm ready. <laughs> oh, God, I pulled on this handle and it wouldn't come up. This handle wouldn't fire. What am I going to do now? Pull the right handle, left handle uh, to get rid of the seat kit and the integrated harness. Get out of the seat, go downstairs, and bail out manually. Now, here's an aside. There's only one guy ever bailed out manually out of a B-52, and he happened to be one of my best friends. 
We went through the Stead Trek together, Mike Rooney's his name. We were trek mates and slept in a tent in the mountains in uh, the Sierras for a week together. And then we went through uh, weapon, nuclear weapons training together. We drove out to Wichita and came back through nuclear weapons training and went to Castle Air Force Base and checked out the B-52 together. Years later, we checked out together in the F-111 at Nellis. And even after that, he took my job at uh, Upper Hayford, England. We traded, but we didn't see each other. Anyway, Mike Rooney was a co-pilot that about seven months to the hour after our crash, he was in a crash over Palomar, Spain, that most of you know about, where they lost nuclear bombs into the Mediterranean and all. And what he did was he got out of the seat, went downstairs, and he is sitting on the IN jump seat, which is also a John. Think of that. A John with a lap belt. <laughs> and he jumped on that. And he's sitting there, and the guy that took his place was a, a staff guy that was not doing it very often, and he ran right into the plane. Instantly, Mike was in a dangerous situation downstairs, and all he had on was a parachute and a john. He re released the lap belt, both navigators left. He jumped at the hatch, tried to pull himself through and could not. But then the plane started to break up. Now it's full of fuel. It's on a chrome belt mission with new bombs in the back. And he, he yeah, no problem. And he tried to pull himself out, but the G forces wouldn't let him go through the hatch. And then the plane broke up and threw him through. And he rolled along the belly. And as you know, there's radio antennas and all that. One sliced his left cheek right to the bone. And he's bleeding to death coming down in his parachute. And a Spanish fisherman literally caught him, compressed him, took him to a hospital, and he was saved. So he had a wreck there. And later, he was in Vietnam flying an O-1 bird dog and took an AK-47 round in a very heroic situation that he was in, right through the scar, lodged in his back when I've seen this bullet, and he has it in a little case now. But uh, it, it just missed his femoral artery, and he is bleeding to death. And he's alone in this little tiny airplane over Vietnam with the Viet Cong right below him because they just shot him and he couldn't get a hold of his company, and he just looked for a clearing pulled the throttle to idle, put his finger in the bullet hole, and he just found a clearing, and he just came down and just literally smashed it in. And his description I won't get into because it might make the kids sick, but uh, he fell out, passed out. They got him, they saved him, and he's okay now, but he does have some memories. We figured out years later that when I when uh, the German Air Force shoots down a plane, if it's a four-engine plane, they get credit for four kills. You shoot down a single-engine plane, you get credit for one kill. So Mike and I figured, well, let's add this up. Between us, we had wrecked, as first lieutenants, three B-52s, a KC-135, an SA-16, and an O-1 bird dog. And he was the only one doing any of the flying. So they said, oh, we've got to get rid of these guys. They didn't let us out and get the So they re so that was Mike. Okay, here's what happened in my crash. We hit, I told you about some of that, and the time frame just was different. The whole mindset from that day to this has been different. And I can't tolerate some things, and I do tolerate others, but here's why. I ejected, and finally I couldn't pull this handle. And I said, okay, you got one last chance left. You can't get out of this plane unless this thing fires. And I looked down like that. I said, fire, you SOB. Bam! Just like that. I got my head to about that point. Got it cracked. Broke my neck. Pulled this uh, hip out of joint. And something hit me in the left calf. And just mangled it. But the VA says, oh, you're just perfectly fine. It's not a problem. Everything's just great. It took me uh, until just last year to finally get him to acknowledge that I was actually in a crash. So I came out, and as my head was down, I watched that the, the hatch come down, and the, it just slowly fell away. But then my head went through the hatch, and then I fell backwards like that. I sensed this tail going by, and just as I'm going over backwards, the plane blew up. And thank God I was still in the seat, I think, because things hit the seat, and something, my leg went flying, and something hit me in the calf. So finally, the next thing I knew, I'm in a parachute coming down. And I'm looking down, and I kept thinking, Rome is burning. The whole ocean was aflame. 
there was half a million pounds of gas burning plus uh, 102 bombs were blowing up. And it's all down there, and I, I just think, this is Dante's Inferno. It's hell down there. I said, Lord, please keep me in this shape. Keep me here forever and ever and ever. I'll stay here and live the rest of my life here, but don't drop me into that stuff. <laughs> well, I had to look around, and I, I, I looked around, and over here, I, I had a broken neck. I don't know how I did any of this, but I pulled my chute, however you do it, you know, you pull this, and my chute twisted around. There's a guy over there. Hey, hey. Pull it back. Hey, wait, wait, wait. Uh-oh, this thing's, uh-oh. Oh, God, how do I get this? It just kept spinning, and it was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And I thought, da -da. I finally popped it and got it to stop. And then I looked down, and I didn't tell you guys this yesterday. I didn't have time. There was a column, a nuclear column, like a mushroom cloud, but it was just a column of heat coming straight up at me. And it just literally went whizzing by about as far away as that wall was. I mean, just a column of stuff. And it just went right up. All this uh, fires from the ocean rose it up, went right by me, and it kicked my chute, and it started swinging. And I'm swinging. And the next thing I know, I'm looking down into the bowl of my chute at the fires below, and I'm thinking, what do I do now? And of all things, University of Physics, the law of conservation of angular momentum came to mind, and I said, pop the seat kit. Pop the seat kit, the life raft came out and blew up. I mean, it filled up. And the seat kit came down and it stabilized the aircraft. Later they told us, don't do that because it'll throw you unstable. I said, no, no, no. Safety-wise, deploy the kit. If you need, you need to deploy it before you hit anyway, because it'll break your legs if you don't get it, get rid of that stuff from your butt when, you, when this stuff happens. So I deployed it and it stabilized it. I'm sitting there saying, I'm not going to screw with this parachute ever again. Because it's going <laughs> to kill me. Well, it tried to kill me two more times. So I came down and it's getting closer and closer. And they say, if any of you have ever flown with the military, they say. When you're holding on, just hold on and look out. Peep, peep, oh God, keep me out of that stuff. The waves were higher than this building. And uh, it was blowing. So uh, typhoons, 100 knots. So I came down and suddenly I hit the water, bam. I didn't even go in past here. The next thing I knew, I was being dragged along at about probably close to 100 knots. And I was spinning and swallowing water every time I rolled over this way. And it was just being forced down my throat. And I'm coughing it up, and I finally <clears throat> stabilized like this. And I said, OK, we have rain tabs. You pop these open, and you pull the rings, and the parachute goes. They were brand new. This is the first flight they ever used them on. They, they had a, what we call a PIF, pilot information file. So what you got to do now is take these rings 10 times for the next five flights, and Get them loosened up so you can release them. This is sock. Wait a minute. You're not supposed to do it that way. You're supposed to have these ready for us to use. All my strength, I couldn't release it. All my strength over here, I couldn't release one. And I was going like that. Oh, that out of hell, excuse me. Down, up and down these waves, and I finally got, ah, and one release. I think it went flying off like a bull whip. And I saw the life raft, and I, I'm, I'm stunned. Now, by this time, the fires were out. And it's nearly, it's, I think it would be pitch black, but it's not. The ocean, the plankton was all stirred up, and it glowed. It was turquoise blue, just bright. So I saw the life raft, and I pulled it over, and I sat myself in it. And you know, I sleep on a pillow about twice as large as what that thing was like. Inside, it's about this long and about this wide. A fat man couldn't sit in. But I got in it, and I was a little, I weighed about 120 pounds at the time. So I got in that thing, and I pulled my life raft in, and I, I, I stopped, and I got it in, and then I looked. And what I'm looking at is waves up here, and waves up here, and they're all around. And then the next thing you know, it took about 10 seconds, and you're up on top. You can see the world. Next thing you know, you're down on the bottom. What does that do to your stomach, your head, your mind? <laughs> And it was wild, so I'm sitting there floating up and down and going up and down, but I'm alive. And I opened my seat kit, I tried to, I had to cut the thing out. We have a little knife right here, it's got a hook blade on it, and you can cut the parachute lines, 
and you can take the switchblade on the other end of it, flip it, and you've got a, a switchblade knife that's very, very sharp. So I'm, I'm sitting in there, and I cut the zipper out of this survival kit, and I carefully put my thing away with the hook blade down again, you know. I'm still connected to the parachute and completely forgotten that. So I get out my survival kit, and I've got a nice little booklet here that tells me how to survive in the Arctic. <laughs> I got a ski mask. I got a sleeping bag, all compressed. I put it on the edge and I watched it float down. I, go, I put together a little hornet rifle. What am I going to do? Shoot polar bears with this thing? I tried to find something I could use. There were no radios, there were no flares, there was no nothing in this seat kit. It was an Arctic survival kit. A defective parachute, an Arctic <coughs> survival kit in the summer in the South China Sea, and I nearly froze to death. The wind was high and it was cold. It was chilly you know, because the wind chill just lowered it. So I'm sitting there freezing. I'm just mad as bloody. And I look up and I say, oh, Lord, I said, please save me from this. And essentially, it changed my religion right here, too. <laughs> I found out Santa, I mean, God is not Santa Claus. I said, please save me. And I, the heavens didn't part. The trumpets didn't blare. But I heard, swear to this day, I heard something say, do it yourself. I want to see how you're going to handle this situation. So, oh, Lord, thanks a lot. So I'm floating around here for a while, and I could go home. Then I looked up, and about where the freeway, now a little farther than about where across the freeway, um, I, I'd say a quarter to a half a mile away, there was a big orange and black ship traveling along. I go down in the waves, and I come up. There it is. Come down, look up, and there's a white ship, an ocean liner traveling this way. It's a Japanese uh, ocean liner, and this was a Norwegian freighter called the Argo. And I thought, they're going to hit. And I looked over here, and they didn't, because I, I could only see them for a few seconds at a time, for out of, out of 20 seconds. And the white ship came by here, and he nearly run over, who later turned out to be my EW, was firing flares, and they nearly ran over him. A tanker went across this ship at 50 feet, he said, dumping fuel all over his deck, and he still wouldn't come up on emergency frequencies. But they got the Norwegian freighter, and he eventually, he eventually saved us. But in the meantime, I'm connected to this parachute, my life raft deflated, and my survival kit and, and everything just suddenly pulled me under. I'm underwater, and I'm connected to this. And I knew I couldn't pull this out, so I got my, my little hook blade out, grabbed this thing and started cutting, and that wasn't going to make it. And I was going under. So I took the switch blade on the other side and I started slicing. I still got little scars on my fingers from it, but I just was cutting as much as I could. Threw that away. I had tied myself to the life raft earlier, thank God, because I followed, and that was not the string that I cut up. And I went to the service and I grabbed that life raft, and it was about the size of a basketball. Took my switchblade, put it away, put it in there, wrapped it up later, and I got mad again. And I took the stem of the, of the, of the manual blow-up thing, and I blew that thing up, turned it, tightened it down, and did all the stuff I needed to do, and I got in that life raft. Now I have several hours to wait. But there were at least 60 items that nearly killed me during this time. I was out in the water about five hours. So uh, things are happening, and. I'd see planes going out by, and a tanker went by about right here at 200 feet, and I'm looking, I can see people, they're close. And they got this cargo door open or something, and they're throwing things out. And one thing came out, it was a big, round, 20-man life raft. It came out, popped, fluttered, went down into the water, I went down, came up, it was gone, just like this. And the tanker pilot later asked me, why didn't you just swim over there? It's only a couple hundred yards. I said, where? I couldn't see it. I didn't even know what direction after two or three times in the waves, you know. So he went on by, and a little while later, I heard, there were planes all over. I heard this boom, boom, boom. Go down and always, the, the typhoon was dying down. And the sun came up, and it's kind of bright sunshine finally. And the typhoon <coughs> was passing. And I looked, and here's this little seaplane bobbing up and down and coming toward me. I took my gun, I emptied it out, and I bam, bam, bam. He didn't see that or hear it, but I, I had to do it anyway. I put the gun away carefully, and I tried everything I could do, and I waved at him, and the tanker was seeing me. 
It was very hard to see a life raft, and we changed the color of the life raft from bright yellow to bright orange, and it worked. The Air Force and Navy now uses one-man life rafts are orange, and they're our design from our, from our crash. So this seaplane comes over, and he's coming right at me, and I'm just, I, you, you don't know the elation. I just knew that here I am, I'm down on the other side of the world from my home, and the Air Force is coming and they're going to rescue me. And they came up, and he turned around right here, and he backed up. And here's this big propeller going around right there, and these floats on the edge, on the end of the pontoons, on the end of their uh, wings. There was one there, and it had a tie down around the end of it. And I reached over, and I grabbed that thing, and I wouldn't let go of it. And they, they put a PJ, a para-jumper. These are like Navy trained SEALs, but they're more medically trained. He jumped in the water, and apparently, I'm holding onto this thing because I'm looking at that propeller. And suddenly this kid pops up out of the water. And says, Whoa, who are you, Neptune? And he says, come on, Lieutenant, let go of that thing and we'll go over here in that door. And I said, you don't even belong there. He was naked, you know, he was in his swimming suit. So he grabbed me and he says, come on, let go. And so I said, okay. And he pulled me over to the uh, door. It wasn't far, it just bugs far away to there. <clears throat> And I got over there, they grabbed me, pulled me in, and they slipped my life raft and threw it away. I said, wait, I wanted that thing. <laughs> and uh, I had my helmet. I retained that. They took that off. They took my flight suit off. All I had on was my shorts after a bit. They wrapped me in a blanket, cut a May West in half, and say, barf into this because I was so seasick. So I sat there just happily, <laughs> barfing and happy as a clown. 